And uh, as we move into this shift from, you know, predominantly Catholic rule and religion to Protestant, Calvinist, um, Lutheran viewpoints, the Catholic Church wasn't silent in this time period. They had a reaction as well. But you can't, I mean, it wasn't only a response to the Protestant Reformation that the Catholic Church began to become more active and diligent. Um, In fact, some of their reform had already began to be put into place. And so a major focus of the Catholic Reformation was more rigorous training of priests to avoid the abuses that had left the church open to Protestant criticism. Uh, Many view the Catholic Reformation as a response to Luther, and yes, perhaps some, but reformative measures, like I said, had already been deemed necessary well before Luther was even born. The Catholic Reformation was as much an answer to its own internal concerns as it was a response to outside protest. One of the most important events in the Catholic Reformation was the Council of Trent, which was 1545 to 1563. Trent brought accountability and greater organization throughout the Catholic Church. Stronger authority was given to the Pope, uh, to bishops, and to priests. Theology and church practice were regulated, and the Mass was affirmed as the center of Catholic worship. Specific rules, called canons, for the Mass were organized and made universal for all Catholics. The Latin Vulgate was affirmed as the official translation of Scripture for the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church schools uh, for children were established, and renewed focus was placed upon missions. Catholics were among the first to send missionaries to Latin America, Asia, India, and Africa. Uh, in fact, the, the missionary efforts of the Catholic Church in Asia is a It's a pretty fascinating topic. In fact, there is a Japanese Catholic author by the name of Shushako Indu, and he wrote a text called Silence. And it's an interesting novel. It deals with the Jesuits who went to Japan, suffered persecution. Uh, It's a historical event, but he creates this novel around this historical event. And in fact, Martin Scorsese right now is putting together filming a movie based on that so if you ever want to know more about uh, the catholic you know reformation and their efforts of continuing missionary endeavors in asia particularly in this time period there'll be a great movie coming out that kind of depicts that event but the spiritual fervor of Catholic Reformation spawned numerous new religious orders, specifically like the one that I just mentioned, as the uh, the Society of Jesus, also known as the Jesuits. Uh, they were founded in um, by the Basque nobleman Ignatius Loyola. Now, he lived from 1491 to 1556. Now, Loyola, in 1534, um, came up with this society of Jesus, the Jesuits, and this concept was ratified by the Pope in 1540. Now this, you know, society of Jesus was kind of a bringing together of people who had a similar focus, Catholic focus, theology, um, but they weren't, you know, necessarily the most prestigious of people, um, but so this handful of, of ragged companions uh, that Ignatius had put together mushroomed into an international organization of some 13,000 members. Now, the Jesuits' success was matched only by the deep distrust they aroused in Catholic as well as Protestant circles. Uh, Jesuitical has its cognates in many European languages, Myths about the Jesuits were plentiful, Um, but to be clear, they were not founded to serve necessarily as anti-Protestant shock troops, which is kind of the myth that they were like a militia to combat the Protestant movement, and they did not take a special vow of loyalty to the Pope, which was one of the rumors. Rather, they take a pledge 
to go on mission anywhere in the world at the Pope's command. Um, their original vocation, and for long their forte, was education. In fact, many Jesuit schools um, to this day exist. Uh, Jesuit schools offered a free education to the poor and places where um, there was much demand from social elites, including some Protestants, they would put these schools. But the Jesuits were soon drawn into the vanguard of campaign to recover space and souls from the Reformation. They were active preachers and confessors across Germany and Poland and as missionaries in Sweden and the British Isles. The unique Jesuit ethos came from a marriage between traditional monastic structures and flexible activism. It also reflected the influence of a remarkable book uh, known as Ignatius's Spiritual Exercises, which is basically a how-to manual of um, interior, interiorized and imaginative prayer. The Jesuits' instinct was to reform society from the top down starting with the elites of society. Although other religious orders had teachers, learned members, and even ran schools, the Jesuits were unique not only because of the scale of their enterprise, but also in the methods they used. Their teaching was systematic, balancing content with structure. Humanist emphasis on rhetoric and the importance of the active life was matched with emphasis on scholastic rigor and progression, according to which pupils were not permitted to move up a grade until they had satisfied their teachers that they had reached the required level of proficiency. Central to the pedagogic method was repetition and competition. To this end, classes were broken down into groups of ten, each of which were led by a responsible pupil who took the pupils through their paces by means of competitive games while the teacher marked homework. Corporal punishment was only used as a last resort and was never inflicted by the teacher but by an outsider especially appointed for that purpose. All this was set out in great detail in the method or plan of studies, the Ratio Studiorum, 1599, a document which may be considered the Magna Carta of European high school education for centuries. But back to Loyola. Um, Ignatius of Loyola was born in 1491 in Guiposcoa, part of the Basque country of the Spanish side of the Pyrenees Mountains. A vain and worldly young soldier who loved courtly romance and a life of adventure, he suffered a traumatic wound at the Battle of Pamplona in 1521, and while recuperating, turned his mind to religion. For the next two decades, he wandered penniless through Europe, made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, studied for the priesthood in Paris, and spread his spiritual example to a growing number of followers. His spiritual exercises uh, text contained methods of prayers and religious self-discipline, and it became the handbook of the Jesuit order. While his frequent visions of Jesus and the Virgin Mary enhanced his reputation for saintliness, the order, which he founded in 1540, spread throughout Europe, gained great political and religious influence, and became the intellectual powerhouse of counter-Reformation Catholicism. Ignatio was a mystic that loved God with a rare intensity, including a love for the saints. He was not a renowned erudite like Augustine or Thomas Aquinas, nor a martyr like Peter or Paul, nor a grand writer like Teresa de Avila, or Benito, not quite, perhaps a personality very dear, such as St. Francis or Teresa de Lisieux, but he loved God, and he loved the world, and these two things he did quite well, and he went down in history for it. Um, the Catholic Reformation saints um, are interesting because, like I said, in this time period, we had this emergence or resurgence, kind of a revival of Catholicism that was competing alongside the Protestant Reformation movement. Um, but interestingly, 
there there are 55 saints that were canonized by the Roman Catholic Church between the years 1588 and 1776. And uh, pretty much they're known as the Catholic Reformation saints. This period of relatively frequent canonizations was both preceded and followed by lengthy periods in which no candidates were elevated to sainthood. So there was something in this event, in this time period, that uh, led to more saints being canonized. Uh, The figures canonized during these years reflect a distinctive conception of holiness inspired by the Catholic Reformation. Most of the Catholic Reformation saints represent the ideals and aspirations of a renewed and combative church energized by the Protestant challenge and the rapid expansion of Catholicism into the New World and Asia. The church recognized as holy those who were active in strengthening the Catholic community or in missionary enterprises. The church also canonized individuals who promoted and put into effect the decrees of the Council of Trent. Finally, despite some apprehension among church authorities, a number of mystics from Spain and Italy were also recognized as holy by the church. Um, To look at a couple of these saints... um, two that are mentioned in your text as well, are St. John of the Cross and uh, Teresa de Avila. So firstly, St. John of the Cross. Now, he was a Roman Catholic mystic, poet, and doctor of the church. From a childhood of poverty in the 16th century to a final illness that ate away at his body, John of the Cross underwent all manner of suffering with a patience born from compassion He's renowned for his poetry, which describes the dark night of the soul. If you've ever heard that, that's where it comes from. And the soul's mystical union with God. John was born in 1542 near Avila, Spain. Through the generosity of people who recognize his gift, the boy was able to attend primary school and the Jesuit school at Medina. And the following year, he entered the University of Salamanca for a three-year course in the arts, followed by a year's discourse in theology. In September 1567, he met Teresa de Avila at Medina and agreed to join her discalled, or barefoot is actually what that means, Carmelite reform, um, which basically means they were a monastery and they didn't wear shoes. I mean, that's pretty much what it means. So, um, Taking the reform vows on November 28, 15, November 28, 1568. Three years later, he went to the University of Alcalá de Henares, where he served as rector of the College of the Reform and directed the Carmelite nuns. From 1572 to 1577, he was a confessor to the convent of the Incarnation in Avila, during which time he and Teresa were in close spiritual dialogue. Um, Now for a look at his works, his contributions, in a literary sense. Now, the work of St. John consists of poetry and mystical commentaries that he wrote on some of his own poems, which is interesting, but best known are the spiritual canticle, the living flame of love, the dark night of the soul, and ascent of Mount Carmel. The last two works comment on the same poem. It's not easy to define the nature of those commentaries since they are at once didactic and tending to teach something and in kind of a scholastic way, which is obscure and symbolic. And uh, I, I briefly brush with a little bit of an explanation of some of the scholastic philosophy in chapter 19. Um, but realism and nominalism are those two in those two ideas and they're way abstract and there's no really easy way to talk about it but the traditional division of spiritual life into the three ways of purgation illumination and union provides the basic framework for all of John's treatises yet the order of succession appears clearly only in the spiritual canticle Now, in the ascent of Mount Carmel and the dark night of the soul, the process of spiritual life is considered mainly from the purgative point of view to reach the union of light. The soul must pass through the night of purification. Yet in this purifying night, John also includes the illumination of faith and even the union with God. The soul can be 
fully purified only in the highest mystical states. The three ways then must not be considered as definitive stages of rectilinear succession. The nature is cyclical, that is, they appear at each level of the mystical life. The ascent of Mount Carmel deals primarily with the early stages of spiritual life, the active purification and of the senses, which is in book one, and the spirit, intellect, memory, and will are in books two and three. The passive purgation is described in the dark night of the soul. Here also the purgation of the senses, book one, is distinguished from that of the spirit, which is book two. The union with God is treated explicitly in the spiritual canticle and the living flame of love. I know that was complicated. Um, Just take it at face value. Aside from being the most important Christian mystical writer, John is one of the greatest poets in the Spanish language. His prose has been influential on the development of the literary language of his culture. St. Teresa de Avila, she was born March 28, 1515 in Avila, Spain, and died October 4, 1582 in Alba, Spain. St. Teresa Avila, the Spanish mystic, was born of an aristocratic family of Avila. In 1535, she entered a Carmelite convent there, and four years later was prostrated by a long illness, probably of psychological origin. However, she had already felt the call to contemplation, and about the age of 40, after a long struggle, she received a second conversion, which turned her toward an intense practice of contemplation. Um, Contemplative prayer, just as kind of an explanatory thing, is uh, it's kind of a form of meditation prayer, where you're you know, I don't know, it's kind of a visual visualization process of prayer where it often ends in some kinds of open visions and things like that, which hence why we're talking about them as mystics. Now, her order was relatively lax in its rules, and she felt impelled to begin a reform. In 1562, a reformed convent was established in Avila under her direction. After five years, despite ill health, an official opposition, she began energetically to spread the reform to other parts of Spain. She died in 1582 after a three-year illness. Her main works were her life, 1562 to 1565, the way of perfection, 1565, and the interior castle, 1577. The first is a full account of her inner experiences, and the last gives a more systematic description of the contemplative life. Her account of the stages of mysticism in the life uses the analogy of watering a garden by various means. Once the weeds have been uprooted, irrigation is needed. Those who bring the water from a well are compared to beginners in prayer and meditation. It is a laborious activity involving the taming of the senses so that they are no longer distracting. The second stage of meditation is reached with the prayer of quiet. This is compared to irrigating the garden by a water wheel. The third mode of watering is by a running brook. This corresponds to a state of contemplation in which effort is no longer needed, as if the work were done by the Lord. It is, according to St. Teresa, a celestial frenzy um, in which the, the faculties of sense perception no longer function. The soul no longer wishes to live in the world, but solely in union with God. The intellect is worth nothing, for ordinary modes of understanding are considered irrelevant and nonsensical. In the fourth stage, which is compared to a shower falling on the garden, the soul is totally passive and receptive, all its faculties somehow united with God. The soul cannot properly understand what is occurring, but afterward it is certain that there has been a union with God. Like I said, hence mystics. Okay. In the interior castle, St. Teresa supplements her early account, her earlier account comparing the contemplative life to entering a castle or palace in which there are many rooms. They are arranged uh, concentrically in six rings of rooms or mansions, round an inner chamber where the king lives. To enter this castle, prayer is needed, 
Ordinary Christians can enter the first three mansions through humility, meditation, and exemplary conduct, and the attainment of the third mansion represents the life achievement of many worthy Christians. But more remains in the spiritual life than such a virtuous existence. The fourth mansion corresponds to the second water of St. Teresa's earlier simile. In the fifth, the soul seems to be asleep and unconscious both of the external world and of itself. Although such language is analogical, the contemplative is not literally asleep. The soul is illuminated in this state by God. The sixth mansion is like a couple's first sight of one another at a betrothal. Finally, the soul enters the Holy of Holies. It seems as if this place is dark because of the overpowering strength of the divine light. Here the soul has a direct vision of God, like the beatific vision to be enjoyed hereafter in heaven. Throughout these descriptions, St. Teresa makes frequent use of the imagery of love and of marriage. The distinction between the betrothal and the marriage is found also in the writings of St. John of the Cross, a friend and follower of St. Teresa. The detail and sensitivity of St. Teresa's autobiographical reports have given her a special importance in the history of mysticism. Um, some of her life works, life and works continued, um, would be to note that Teresa came to her career as a religious reformer relatively late in life, as we mentioned. Uh, she joined the Carmelite convent of the Incarnation just outside of Ila in 1535 and took her vows in 1536 as Teresa of Jesus. In the book of her life, 1562 to 1565, she wrote that she withheld her wholehearted consent to the vocation until 1556, when she had two spiritual experiences that definitively turned her away from secular life. For these 20 years of irresolution, during which she suffered serious illnesses and experienced frightening visions that some confessors attributed to the devil, Teresa blamed the mitigated and relaxed rule of the Carmelite convents, which among other liberties permitted nuns to come and go freely and to receive unlimited visitors. In condemning such lapses in monastic enclosure, Teresa participated in 16th century movements to reform the Roman Catholic Church from within or the Counter-Reformation. In 1560, Philip II who ruled from 1556 to 1598, called on Spanish monasteries monasteries to contribute to his war against the Protestant Reformation by intensifying religious discipline. On August 24th, 1562, a house in Avila was consecrated as the convent of St. Joseph. Under a constitution, Teresa based on the one, the tw the... 1247 formulation of Carmelite rule requiring strict asceticism and complete poverty. For the austere dress, Teresa designed habits of coarse fabrics and straw sandals. Initiates were labeled discalced, barefoot Carmelites. The new convent faced immediate threats to its existence. Some church officials considered that Teresa, known to practice a spirituality based on contemplation, might lead her nuns to abandon vocal prayer for mental prayer, which threatened both ecclesiastical authority and ecclesiastical income. Municipal officials of Avila brought a lawsuit that was probably motivated by concern that a convent without an endowment could become dependent on civic financial resources. Teresa's project of religious reform brought her allies as well as enemies in the church, Monastic orders and aristocracy. Giovanna Battista Rossi, uh, 1507 to 1578, uh, the Carmelite prior general rule from Rome, found St. Joseph so impressive on his 1567 supervisory visit that he gave Teresa permission to found monasteries throughout Spain and with the explicit exception of Andalusia. Having secured this credential, Teresa began her travels around Spain in horse-drawn wagons. She eventually found founded 14, no wait, 15 convents, 
and monasteries herself and authorized other discalced Carmelites to found two more. Teresa garnered much of her financial support and numerous recruits from Converso families who found most monastic orders, including the Carmelites, after 1566 closed to them. Uh, in case you don't know, Conversos are uh, forced conversions of Jews. And so Teresa was actually the granddaughter of Jewish Conversos. So she had Jewish blood. Um, around 1562, Teresa began writing prolifically, both at the command of confessors and for her own purposes. First, the autobiographical book of her life uh, was composed 1562 to 1565 and published in 1588, followed by the devotional instruction in Way of Perfection, composed 1566 to 1569 and published in 1588, description of her mystical experiences in the interior castle, as we mentioned, were composed 1577, published in 1588, a chronicle of the origins of the Discalced Carmelites in the Foundations, composed in 1582, published in 1610, and several short works and numerous letters. Teresa probably would be remembered only as a charismatic reformer, but for reports that her body, when exhumed nine months after her death, had not deteriorated, Um, Stories of other miracles began to accumulate as well, and in 1591, the Bishop of Salamanca initiated the process that in 1622 made her a saint. In 1970, she became the first female doctor of the church. And so there we have a look at the Catholic Reformation, also known as the Counter-Reformation, and a little bit of a close look at the Jesuits and Ignatius Loyola, as well as the Catholic Reformation saints, St. John of the Cross, his works, and St. Teresa de Avila and her life and works. And that brings this lecture to a close.